Hello and welcome to the second virtual history of 2021 presented by Baltimore Architecture Foundation and Baltimore Heritage. My name is Nathan Denny's Associate Director of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. We have an exciting lineup this year and it's thanks to your support that we're able to offer virtual history each Friday for free. So thank you to everyone who donated to be with us today. We encourage you to make donations to BAF and Baltimore Heritage to support the series and the many ways our organizations are promoting Baltimore architecture and history over the course of the pandemic. And next week, we will be returning to Lake Clifton High School to learn more about what happened uh, to what was at the time of construction, one of the largest and most modern schools in the country. Julian Frost, a City College alum currently studying at Bryn Mawr College, will be presenting. And then the following week on January 29th, a very special talk with Morgan State Professor Dale Green on, er on Baltimore's early Black architects. Finally, by tuning into our virtual histories, you might have a leg up in our virtual Groundhog Day Architecture Trivia Night. I hope you can join us on February 2nd. You can play as an individual or a team and win a prize from Peabody Heights Brewery. Learn more about all these programs at www.baltimorearchitecture.org. And now today's presentation. Meg Fielding is back to take us on another architecture adventure, this time focusing on Baltimore's historic school buildings. Meg is a past president of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation, and I encourage you to follow her Instagram handle, Pig Town Design, to follow more of her architecture adventures. If you have questions for Meg, please add them to the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. With that, take it away, Meg. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to see you. Can you hear me, Nathan? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm glad to see everybody. And um, this presentation is going to be on the city public school system. Um, it was established in 1829 and over the next few decades, um, the city built schools as they were needed. But from the late 1800s to the 1930s, education around the country and in Baltimore underwent a huge sea change. Realization that education was important to the economy finally dawned on leadership. Before 1900, most children had no more than a few years of rudimentary education before they left to work in factories, on farms, or as domestic labor. Progressive reforms at the city school system really began in 1895 when modern standards for school architecture were first adopted. Uh, in 1920, a comprehensive reevaluation of the school system initiated, um, initiated the, schools, the city's first plan for school facilities. Um, sorry about this. Oh, we had a little technical difficulty first thing this morning. Here we go. And Nathan, am I still not showing up? Nathan? Oh, you. Yeah, yeah, you see your video, the screen's there, everything is going A-OK. -okay. Uh, but I'm not showing up. You are showing up, yeah. Oh, OK. I can't see myself, <laughs> which is probably good. Um, between 1920 and 1926, the school board built 26 new schools with a total capacity of 27,570 pupils. In addition to construction of the new buildings, the school board worked to upgrade existing facilities and acquire future sites for construction. These achievements radically transformed the city school system, making the 1920s a golden decade of education in Baltimore. Because so many major projects were occurring simultaneously, the work was spread broadly among numerous architecture firms. The roster included Buckler and Fenhagen, Ellicott and Emmert, Clyde and Nelson Fritz, Matu and White, Owens and Cisco, Palmer and Lambden, Parker Thomas and Wright, Josias Pennington, Joseph Evans Sperry, and Wyatt and Nolting. Many of these firms were also designing homes and other buildings around Baltimore at this time. One thing you will notice as we look at some of the older schools is that there are two entrances, one for boys and another for girls. Gender segregation was a product of an era when transitional gender roles determined scholastic, professional, and social opportunities. Boys were steered towards the trades, including carpentry and metalwork, while girls learned sewing, cooking, and housekeeping. 
I had a lot of thoughts about how I present this lecture and finally decided on a combination of things. I mostly focused on the west side of the city because that was where some of the more interesting older schools um, were located. And I also picked a few architectural and sentimental favorites that I discovered along the way. And no, we're not starting the screen until now. This is the Patrick Henry Elementary School. Um, and this was the building that first got me started in searching out Baltimore's old schools. I drove by this building one day and just stopped in my tracks. It looked familiar, but I knew I'd never seen it. So I did some research and found that it had been a school and was designed by Ellicott and Emmert, the architects who designed my offices here at MedKai. And then I found out that the city of Baltimore had a program in the early 1900s to hire the best architects to create beautiful buildings for schools. So this led to my search for early 1900s schools and in doing that search, I found a lot more. This is the Marston's University School. And although this isn't the building that Ellicott and Emmer designed for my offices, we also own this building. It was the Marston's University School, which was founded in 1898 and designed by Joseph Evans Sperry. Several other private schools, including Park, Friends, Bryn Mawr, and Boys Latin were located in the immediate area. It was purchased by the city school system in 1907 and became the Robert E. Lee School number 49, an accelerated junior high school. In the 1970s, MedKai bought it from the city for a dollar and we renovated it in the 1980s. And this is my office. These three windows right here are my office. This is um, Eastern Female High School and it's over on Ath Asquith Street. And unfortunately, it's in really sad condition right now. But it was founded in 1944, 1844. And it was one of the pioneer public schools in the country devoted to secondary education for women. From its founding, the school is noted for its innovative program, which prepared girls for college or teacher school or for using a business course for a vocation. This building was erected in 1869, but it moved to larger quarters on North Avenue in 1907 and then to its final location on 33rd Street in 1938. And this is you know, an Italian villa style. Um, I've heard that it possibly is um, going to be a, become a theater and arts um, group. Uh, but you know who knows about that but it really somebody really needs to um renovate this building because it's just it's a great building and it's in very sad shape as you can see and this is where they moved in 1938 so this is eastern high school and as i said the evolution of eastern high is an example of the development of female education the curriculum was continually revised and adjusted to ensure that students were prevent, presented with an education comparable to male students. When the new Eastern High School building opened in 1938, it had an auditorium, gymnasium, cafeteria, typewriting rooms and music rooms, which all had acoustic treatments. And it was also wired for central communications, um, allowing a radio broadcast to be wired throughout the entire building. And this was used up until 1986 and it's now um, offices for Hopkins. And it's a an H sort of modified H shaped building. And um, if you remember, it's right across from where Memorial Stadium used to be. And it's, it's really a massive building. So if you're ever over there, just take a spin around the parking lots um, and you can see how huge it is. I mean, this is, you know, the, the H bar, and this is one of the sides, and that's not even the whole side. So you get a real feeling of, you know, just how big it is. And it's not on Asquith, it's on 33rd Street. I just copied the slide. This is the original Forest Park High School. Um, there is a style um, sort of around the 1920s, and they call it a collegiate Gothic. 
And there are a number of these sort of buildings um, around Baltimore. Um, City College is sort of one. Garrison is. Um, Frederick Douglass is one of those. Um, I think Dunbar. And it sort of combines sort of the Gothic looks, but you know, definitely looks like a school. And then there are also some um, Art Deco elements in here. Um, it is completion in 1923. This was the largest school in Baltimore until City College was built in 1926. It had a capacity of 2,500 students and a wide variety of special rooms and facilities, including an 1,800 seat auditorium, two gymnasiums, one for girls and one for boys, a swimming pool, a library with two study halls, a music room, eight laboratories for chemistry and physics, and a domestic science department with rooms for cooking, sewing, and housekeeping. In 1932, the high school moved out and it became Garrison Junior High um, and is now Garrison Middle School. Um, but this is another one of those buildings that's just enormous. I mean, 2,500 students. I, I don't think there's any school in Baltimore that has that many students now. This is Baltimore City College, as I said, another collegiate Gothic school. It was designed by um, Regan Butler and um, George Corn Corner Fenhagen, and that's Butler. This is um, Fenhagen, and this is Buckler right there. Um, the school was actually founded in 1839, and it's the oldest high school in Baltimore and the third oldest high school in the country. After several moves, this iteration of City College was built in 1926. It's known as the Castle on the Hill with its asymmetrical 150 foot clock tower. Um, the design for the building was chosen after an architectural competition with 18 local architectural firms. The exterior is largely unchanged and it features many figures of animals, birds and people. And um, you could actually look up um, sort of gargoyles on city buildings and there's a Sun Papers feature, photo feature about that, which is kind of interesting. And that's actually where I got these pictures. Um, and you'll see an owl and that's um, sort of a symbol of education. There's also one, um, on the facade of Dunbar, and I've seen them in other um, in other schools that have sort of gargoyle-y kind of things. So this is this was also Baltimore City College. It actually started in this building right here, um, and it was designed. This building was designed by George Frederick, who also designed City Hall, and he was actually 22 when he designed City Hall. Um, they moved from their original this location to this location after a fire in the 1870s and this building with these three pictures are um was designed by baldwin and pennington and when city college moved out in 1920s the western female high school moved from their location on druid hill avenue which we'll see in a minute um and then they subsequently moved out and um, to Falls Road. And then for a little while, it was the Bay College of Maryland. And after a fire in the 1980s, this building was um, renovated and converted into apartments um, called Chesapeake Commons. And until the 1920s, Baltimore only had five high schools um, and they were racially and sexually segregated. Eastern and Western high schools were for white girls and City and Poly for, were for white boys. Poly specialized in math and engineering and City specialized in the arts and the humanities. And there was a separate high school for blacks which later became Douglas High School which we'll also see in a few minutes. This is sort of an outlier. This is Westport um, Elementary School. And if you are going down 295, just after you sort of it transfers from Russell Street to um, 295, you can see Westport on the right side as you're going down, sort of perched up on the top of a hill. Um, it's about 300 feet above sea level. Um, it's an excellent, another excellent example of the collegiate Gothic um, 
sort of designed along sort of Beaux-Arts principles. Um, it figure, has this long sort of block here and then there are two wings, which you can see right here. And actually one of the really funny things about this is um, these are cell towers, but they're disguised with um, brick, uh, brick uh, coating on top of them. Um, it's just a very detailed building. I think it really um, sort of loses something by having this white and obviously the orange and blue door doesn't do a whole lot for the building. Um, but it's just, you know, very elaborate, a very nice school and just really beautifully sited. So next time you're going down 295 or heading to the airport, um, just take a look and see if you can see that school perched up on the hill. So the next few schools are in Old West Baltimore and they encompass some of the oldest schools in the city. So this is Frederick Douglass High School and it was designed to house up to 2,300 um, black students and it opened in 1924-25. It's a late Gothic revival style and it literally takes up an entire block in Sandtown, Winchester. Um, detailing common to the Gothic style is concentrated mainly on the building's entrance. And this guy is right here and this guy is right here. So you can see you know, they really took a lot of care to, you know, have the building elaborate and make it just, you know, a pretty amazing place. And again, it was one of the buildings with, um, you know, a gymnasium for boys and a gymnasium for girls. And so it wasn't really integrated by gender. Um, there was an, uh, an 1800 seat auditorium, which is actually in a center block in the back of this building. Um, the architects were Owens and Cisco. Um, it is now senior living. Um, and actually you can see this is right here. So you can sort of get a real scale of how enormous the building is. Um, and I just think these little guys are great. They're just, um, they're just so funny and, and, you know, really common, you know, gargoyle type figures. This is the Booker T. Washington School, which was the original Western female high school. And it was designed by an Englishman, Alfred Mason, who lived in Baltimore and was somewhat influenced by Louis Sullivan, the Chicago architect. The school had 16 classrooms, two recitation rooms, a library, chemical and physical laboratories, a drawing room, eight cloak rooms, two book rooms, an assembly room, and a tower room in the three-story um, structure. So there was a, a classroom up here, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, it's been extensively added to and remodeled, but the significant exterior architectural features have been retained, which is really lucky because there's not another building like this in the city. Um, the stone carvings and the decorations are the most elaborate on any surviving school in Baltimore. And this is just one of the little faces. I don't think it's right here. It might be right here. This is a, another school sort of over um, sort of Sandtown, Winchester, Old West Baltimore. And it's school number 104. Um, and there was a history of the names and the numbers, um, which is kind of complicating. And it sort of reflects the race relations of the time. The changes in the numbering and naming system reflect the changing view on how to label and segregate African-American schools. And the schools with 100, so this is 104, um, sort of was devised around the turn of the century to separate the numbering of African-American schools from the Caucasian schools. So um, a lot of these um, schools, you'll see when I'm going through this, have two different numbers. So this is um, the Robert Brown Elliott School. Um, it was also designed by Alfred Mason who designed Booker um, T. Washington School. It's a Renaissance revival. Um, it's got this, these nice arched windows, um, sort of rustic brick walls. It's got this overhanging hip roof, which is kind of interesting. And the, one of the research things I said, it said it has the reassuring presence of a secured Renaissance palazzo. Um, 
and I, I thought that was sort of an interesting way to describe the school. But this was um, would have been for ventilation of the buildings. And as sort of we go around, you'll see that on a couple other buildings because um, it acted sort of as a chimney and it pulled the hot air up through the tower. Um, so I, th I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, and this building, I said, is over on Cary Street, and it's now, again, a senior living center, which is what a lot of these schools have been converted to. And you'll see here again, you know, one entrance for boys and one entrance for girls. And it was sort of, um, you know, just keeping them apart from each other, which probably made it easier. I went to an all girls school for probably 12 years. So um, I know how easy it was to not have boys around. Um, this is the William Alexander School, and it has an interesting history. It was, the school is actually tied to a local prominent church. And uh, the idea for an, a black elementary school began with Reverend William Alexander, the pastor of the Sharon Baptist Church, which is right around the corner. And his church initially held classes for African-American students in the basement, which inspired him to petition the city for uh, African-American elementary school. And it represented a new era in public education when the plan called for elementary schools to include kindergarten through grade six. And it replaced the, the former grammar and primary school design or system throughout the school, throughout the school system. And this is sort of a similar design that can be seen in some other schools around the city. And you can see here's the original number um, in the lozenge right here, school 112. Um, it's another building, another school building that's actually um, used for senior living, um, which is really nice that they've reused a lot of these old schools instead of tearing them down. This is a charming little school that I found. Um, it's one of the earliest of two um, surviving public school buildings in the city. And it's um, over in West Baltimore on this tiny little street called Argyle Avenue. Um, it's a little gable roofed brick building. Um, it had been converted into housing. Um, and initially I thought, oh, boys door, girls door. But when you can see these old pic, this old picture, and I think this is from about 1960, early 1960s, you can see that they were actually windows here and the entrance was around on the side. Um, sadly, there's not a lot of information about this school, although somebody just told me that they thought at some point it was the Coppin Normal School, which eventually became um, Coppin College. So, um, but it's just, it's, just a really interesting building. You can see everything sort of around it is no longer there. Um, you know, this is gone. So there's just a lot of vacant lots, but it, it actually took me a couple tries to find this little street because it's only a couple blocks long. This is the um, Henry Highland Garnet School. Um, so again, PS number three. So that meant that it was a school for black children. Um, it's a three bay building. It's um, an ornate entrance, pediment roof, um, stoned band courses. So it's kind of elaborate. Um, others that are similar to this sort of don't have this level of detail. Um, it was converted into a school for black children in 1910 as the demographics of the neighborhood changed. And it was named for um, Henry Highland Garland, who was an abolitionist and preacher um, who had been born into slavery over on the Eastern shore. This school is also known as the Thurgood Marshall School because he attended school here from 1914 to 1920, his first six years of school. Um, the city or state, I can't remember which, just um, had a request for proposals for this building to do something like this. And, um, former BAF board member, Dale Green from Morgan will be working on the project and um, they're gonna be restoring it and they're gonna have areas in there in the building dedicated to Thurgood Marshall and to Elijah Cummings, who was the Congressman for the area for a long time. And we uh, said, we don't know the architect for this building that a lot of the architects are sort of lost in time because it was, such a big building program, unless they were really prominent architects, they just said it was from the um, 
you know, just the building division of the city. This is the Francis Ellen Harper School. Um, another really good looking building, unfortunately not in the best of condition, um, but this was sort of a prototypical model as we'll see in actually the next couple of slides. Um, it was this, this model was uh, developed for the city by JJ Husband of the firm Avery and Hudson. And it was the first grammar school to be built under this plan. Um, its main feature was an open interior, which sort of anticipated the open schools um, of today by about a hundred years. But you can see up here, it says um, PS, um, I think it's 111. Um, so you can see that just in, it's actually 10 um, above here, but it's, I think it's a very handsome school and it's just, it's a shame that nothing's going on um, with it and it's just sort of sitting there deteriorating. This is the um, Robert Perry School. Um, I mean, the Oliver Perry School, and this is actually down in Federal Hill. It's sort of Romanesque. Um, it's just, um, you know, really nice looking building. This is, this, this is one of the schools um, designed by um, Joseph Evans Sperry. Um, hang on a second. Um, it was constructed in 1882. I don't know why that's wrong, sorry. Um, it's straightforward red brick facade shows the influence of a Germanic strain of the Romanesque revival characterized, characterized by the brick detailing. This is a very sort of sharply cut. It's just, you can see right here, you know, it's, it's just sort of a little sharper than some of the other buildings. Um, again, this is a building that is um, senior living now. It's on uh, South Charles Street. Um, and Francis Ellen Harper, oh, actually, sorry, wrong. Francis Ellen Harper, that was the slide before, was actually an African-American poet. And Perry was a naval commander, um, most well known for the saying, don't give up the ship. So this is another one of these sort of very similar schools. This is the um, Sharp Street School. It started out as grammar school number four, and then it became a uh, school for black children. Um, in 19, 1867, Baltimore um, initiated the first program of free education of black children. Um, the, this was one of the first um, grammar schools to be used for that. It's, um, you can see in this old picture, this is obviously the stairs to the second floor. Um, these were probably, you know, the boys and the girls entrances as they were before, they it's sort of been bricked up now. But another handsome building, it's actually right down by um, both of the stadiums. So you might recognize this, this is the Armistead School. It is um, PS33, which is now the Art Center in sort of South Federal Hill. And it's a pretty amazing looking building. And I said a few minutes ago, um, the architect was the office of Baltimore's building inspector because they were building so many schools during this point and time that they just, you know, this is who designed it. Um, there's this three stage projecting stair towers, you see one, two, three, um, with a, this hipped roof and then these two, I mean, I just think it's a really handsome building. Um, you know, it's huge windows that it has are perfect because it's um, art studios now and it works really well. And it's sort of in the Romanesque revival style. Um, and you can see just, you know, the brickwork on it, the fancy brickwork and, you know, again, the boys door and the girls door. Excuse me. Um, so these are two of my favorite schools. This is um, Roland Park School, um, as we used to call it, Roland Park Public School to delineated from Roland Park Country School, which is now right across the street. And it's designed by my favorite architects, Palmer and Lambden. And um, about 25 years after Roland Park was established, it decided it was decided that it needed its own school. So Palmer and Lambden, who designed a lot of the houses in Roland Park and Guilford were tapped to be the architects 
And the Italian eight design is differs from any other school, any other building in the neighborhood, the houses, there's nothing like this. So it really stood out and it's sort of, you know, on a small rise and, and really is, you know, very architecturally significant, but within two years after it was built, um, the school needed to be enlarged and it took the capacity from 800 to 1200. And you can see this addition um, is right here. So it's, um, it's a good looking building. I don't know whether you've seen it about maybe four or five years ago, there was a big thing about the roof because it had been designed with a terracotta roof and the city replaced it, but the person had never installed a terracotta roof and pieces of it started falling down. And then they were gonna put just a plain asphalt roof on it, but um, it's on, I don't know, one of the national registers, so they couldn't. So anyway, after a whole bunch of back and forth, they ended up putting the correct roof. And um, so it, it still maintains its looks. And then this is really one of my favorite schools. This is the um, Louise May Alcott School. And um, at that point they, they named a lot of schools after sort of leading lights of the day. Um, there's an Edgar Allan Poe School and Samuel Coleridge Taylor and this Louisa May Alcott. Um, this is off of Reisterstown Road and you don't really see it very, very well because the sort of short side is facing Reisterstown Road. Um, it's Georgian revival style, you know, it incorporates brick and stucco bands, as you can see here. Um, there was a long, long corridor that went down. So there are classrooms on the side and then big classrooms at either end. And um, each of the upper floors, they contained um, a central corridor, one office and eight classrooms. And again, um, this building is now a senior living center. Um, but I just, I think it's such a handsome building. It's, it looks like it just came out of a Wes Anderson movie. So um, this is a list of the resources which I used for this lecture. Um, Medusa, which is the Maryland State Cultural Resource System is a huge help. And it literally has um, almost every building, you know, that's of any kind of significance um, listed on the building. It's a little hard to figure out how to use, but once you get used to it, it's just a great resource. Um, the CHAP, which is the um, Commission for Ar Architecture on the Stark Preservation, Bottom Architecture Foundation, we have something called the Dead Architects Society. Um, Facebook, there are a couple of um, Baltimore groups. This is Baltimore Old Photos, No Politics, which is actually sort of the really good group because it doesn't get into a lot of, you know, people slamming Baltimore. Um, and the Baltimore History and Baltimore Historical Society are two of the other ones. And then this book, um, or this it's a report, Baltimore School Architecture, 1860 to 1940, um, that um, was, but it's by Peter Kurtz and Marsha Miller at the Maryland Historic Trust. And um, it literally took me three years to find this, um, but it's just a treasure trove of information about um, what happened, you know, this big building boom and the architects and why they did things. And um, anyway, um, it's just, it's a great resource. So are there any questions? Yeah, we, uh, we have some questions coming in and also just lots of interesting um, comments from people who went to some of these schools or had family went to them. Um, lots of interesting details about them. So Meg, I'll be sure to share the comments um, okay. later. Uh, but getting into some of these questions, um, someone was asking uh, if City College is a high school, why was it called a college? This was the way they did it in those days. Um, there are other schools like in New York and um, Boston that are also referred to as colleges. You know, at that point, there weren't tons and tons and tons um, of colleges around. So, you know, most people didn't go to college at that point, but it just, it was what what they called them then. Um, so, and I saw somebody said, you know, they were disappointed that I didn't do poly. Um, I couldn't do every school in the city. So, sorry about that. And another person was asking when these, um, these schools integrated, um, was mentioned, so people was far into the, in the chat with uh, poly and Western integrated in, in the 1950s, I think. Yeah, well, and that's pretty much. After Brown versus Board of Education to start integrating schools. Yeah. Yeah. 
And a question from Jillian here. Uh, Clyde and Nelson Frizz Architects designed three schools in 1924, all based on the same prototype design, the Arlington School, the Hamilton School, and the Walbrook Windsor Hill School. Did any other architecture firms design prototypes for the city? Not that I saw. Um, you know, I, I just, I really focused on, there were 20, 22, I think, schools that I did, which took, you know, every minute of my time um, today. So, you know, I really narrowed it down to these schools, but I think, you know, there was a couple things that were prototypes. And as I went around and looked at um, a lot of these schools, there, there were, you know, some similarities in the way they looked. Um, whoops. Um, you know, this school, um, I don't know whether you just can still see my screen. Um, you know, this, this was sort of a similar style. So I think it was just, um, you know, that, that, that was the style of schools that they did. Okay. Okay. And a follow-up question from Jillian. Um, she was wondering, do you know like, how many of these these school uh, projects were architectural design competitions? The only one I can find was um, City College, and there were eighteen different architecture firms that applied for it. And I think it was the most expensive school in the city. And I think it, at that point it cost um, about three million dollars. So, you know, they knew it was going to be expensive. So I think that's why they had the competition. Um, um, for the architects, so. Yeah, and uh, another question we have here, someone's asking about the future of um, of schools in Baltimore. And uh, right now, uh, the state's going through this um, 21st century schools um, building initiative where they're actually um, renovating a, a lot of schools in the city. Um, I don't, uh, one of them uh, was the Robert Poole School um, which was a really great renovation here in Hamden. And there's, there's plenty of other ones in the city too. Uh, Meg, do you wanna talk about any of that? Yeah, um, you know, I think they finally have realized that it's probably less expensive to, um, Nathan, can you take this down? Can you? Yeah, can... what? Uh... <laughs> Somebody's hijacked our screen. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I think they finally realized that they um, that it's actually better to renovate some of the older schools because they're so well built and so sturdy. I know they took the school at Medfield down and are rebuilding that from scratch, but then they actually um, renovated. Um, I think Montebello was one of the ones they did. The Robert Poole School in Hamden was another one that they um, have just completely renovated and expanded a bit. So. Um, you know, I think it's just a matter of people realizing now that it's um, makes more sense to renovate and restore rather than tear down and start from scratch. Right, and, and some of these projects, uh, these renovations have won awards from AI Baltimore um, and Baltimore yeah. Heritage. Um, the Green Street Academy is a really great example um, as well. Um, beautiful uh, redesign project. I don't see any um, other questions coming in. There's been a couple about school numbering. Um, oh, okay, think, yeah, go ahead. I think they started at one and just went up from there. And then when they started having specific schools for black children, they started at 100. So the schools that have 101, 110, 111, whatever um, in their numbering system um, that um, those were the schools for black children and then the other schools you know, started at one like the school that we own is um, school 49. So if you sort of are taking that, it was built in 1898. So it was probably the 49th of the schools, but Edgar Allan Poe's school was number one. And I um, can't remember what number two was. So um, anyway, anything else? I, I think that's it. And I think we're um, just about out of time here, Meg. Uh, and if you want to see this this recording, you can follow it on our YouTube channel. If you search for Baltimore Architecture Foundation, you can see all of the virtual histories we've we've done up to this point. I think we're into the 30s now with the number of we've done, which is really exciting. And also, if you want to learn more about um, 
Baltimore schools. We have a great presentation coming up next week on Lake Clifton High School, which was built in the 1960s. And at the time of construction, um, I believe was the largest school built in the country. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us and uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you.